I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotting in a jail cell for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and they, and they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean, one minute I, I am a man marked for death and then the next I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. Luke chapter, sorry, that was my fault. I'm probably back there talking, and Mike's like, why can't we hear him? It's because I forgot to turn it on. There it is. <laughs> but as we are studying Luke chapter 23, as we continue verse by verse um, through the book of Luke, we have one chapter left. We're almost there. But last week, we saw this trial, and we saw how powerful the crowd was, and that the judge, who was Pilate, the Roman governor, he came up with the verdict. He, he, he looked at Jesus, he, he questioned Jesus personally, and the verdict was not guilty. But how the crowd overcame the verdict by yelling. And we talked about how powerful a, a crowd can be and how the most potent weapon in the enemy's arsenal is people blindly following the crowd. And so according to tradition, the Romans would release one Jewish prisoner at Passover. And so they had the opportunity to vote. And so Pilate's like, okay, well, they want me to crucify Jesus. Well, let, let, let's put it on them. We'll, we'll leave it up to democracy. Who wants Barabbas to be released? And the crowd goes nuts. Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus. But he's innocent. Crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. And we saw a complete miscarriage of justice. Well, now he's been arrested. But the murderer Barabbas was set free. The first blank on your notes, if you're following along from the, the bulletin or if you're on, on our, our app as well, you can follow it there. But the first blank is the murderer Barabbas was just the first, but certainly not the last, to personally experience the cross and the exchange of Jesus' life for his own. Now, we, have, we have no idea about eternity. We, we don't know if Barabbas became a Jesus follower. You know, I wonder. I wonder if Barabbas, here he was set free and Jesus died in his place. But this was a very a temporal thing where, where Barabbas was there as a prisoner and, and he had earned, he had done crimes and from his crimes he had the penalty. But what Jesus did is Jesus' life was exchanged for his life and Jesus died so that Barabbas could live. I don't know what happened to him after that, but if somebody took my place, I'd probably pay attention when the crowd started saying just a few days later that this Jesus who died in his place rose from the dead. 
But we don't know. We don't know what happened to Barabbas, what happened there. But this morning, we're going to read about several other people who had no idea that when they woke up that morning, they would experience the cross on a level no one else got to experience. They had no idea that they were going to come face to face with Jesus Christ. They had no idea. But we're going to see the results. And what we're going to discover from looking at these men who encountered Jesus and the cross is that if you ever question if God loves you, just look to the cross. And this message is specifically for those in this room who feel like there's no way God could love you. I know. There's people who walk around with this level of guilt and shame. We talked about shame on Resurrection Sunday, and people walk around like there's no way. Like, if people sitting here really knew what I've done or what I've thought, there's no way they would want to be around me. Well, this message is for you, because if you doubt that God loves you, all you got to do is look to the cross, and that's what we're going to do this morning. Jesus, we come here, and we thank you for how you've been working all morning. But Lord, we just ask you in this time that your spirit would speak to us because we are desperate for you. I want to pray specifically for anyone watching online or downstairs, anyone here in this room, anyone on this campus, God, whatever people are going through, we're not looking for people's wisdom. We're not looking for for good ideas or ways to improve our lives. We're looking for transformation. And that only happens by the work of your spirit, Lord. It can't happen through an eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but instead upon God's power. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we left off last week in verse 26. We'll pick the story up right there. Verse 26, Jesus was just found you know, not guilty, but condemned to death. So they lead him off to be crucified. So verse 26, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. It sounds like he just arrived. And put a cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus because Jesus was too weak at this point to carry the cross. We know why. We studied it last week. Jesus was just scourged. In the Roman scourging, we studied this. They would use the cat of nine tails. This is what a Roman cat of nine tails looked like. And they would tie in bits of glass. And here's some actual lead metal that was in a cat of nine tails, a Roman cat of nine tails. And you could see the spikes there. And what they would do is they would take the prisoner... And they would take that cat of nine tails, go across their body, and rip. The idea was to elicit a confession. So they would have a scribe sitting there to record everything that the prisoner said. The idea being that when they were scourging them, they called it famously the 40 minus 1. They didn't call it 39. They called it the 40 minus 1 because 40 was thought to kill a man. So they called it the 40 minus one. And when you were being scourged, they would lighten up if you confessed. So if your back is being ripped to shreds, you'll say anything to get out of it to lighten it up. And it's how they had, quote, swift justice. They had a lot of crime solved because a lot of prisoners would just confess to a crime even if they didn't commit it to get out of it. But Jesus had nothing to confess As a lamb before the shearers is silent, Jesus didn't have a word to say. So he took the full brunt of the 40 minus one. It's no wonder he was too weak to carry the cross. And to get the full picture, I actually want to share with you, this is a, a modern medical 
opinion on what happened with the scourging. You can read this in one of the best books written in the last 30 years is The Case for Christ. And Lee Strobel, he was interviewing different people, experts, to build this case for why his wife was a fool to follow Jesus. And he ended up proving Jesus to himself. So one of the people he interviewed was a medical doctor who also has his PhD, smart guy. So he, this guy was an expert on the heart. His name is Dr. Alexander Metherell. And as they talked about scourging, this medical doctor described it medically, what happened. The back would be so shredded that part of the spine was sometimes exposed by the deep, deep cuts. Think about that for a second. The whipping would have gone all the way from the shoulders down the back, the buttocks and the back of the legs. It was just terrible. He goes on. One physician who has studied Roman beating said, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. It's no wonder most people getting scourged would confess to something. A third century historian by the name of Eusebius described flogging by saying the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. You, you, you think about that a second. You, you, you think about third century eyewitness to Roman scourgings says that they could see the bowels, the internal organs of the victim. And Jesus took the full weight of this. And often guards wouldn't stop at 40. They'd be overcome by anger and rage and just keep, keep going. And many died, but not Jesus from that. We know that many people would die from that kind of beating even before they could be crucified. At the least... Excuse me. The victim would experience tremendous pain and go to go into hypervolemic shock. Hypo means low, vol means refers to volume, and emic means blood. So hypovolemic shock means the person is suffering the effects of losing a large amount of blood. And then he goes on in the, the, the passage to, to just talk about the medical effects of hypovolemic shock. I'd highly encourage you to read this. Jesus was in hypovolemic shock as he staggered up the road to the execution site of Calvary, carrying the horizontal beam of the cross. Finally, Jesus collapsed, and the Roman soldiers ordered Simon to carry the cross for him. And so this flogging, this torture that Jesus went through to elicit a confession, ripping him to shreds, exposing the spine, possibly even the, the internal organs. That's what Jesus just went through as we read verse 26. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. So he's so weak, he can't carry the cross. So they grab this guy, Simon, and tell him to carry it. Well, we know because we've gone, been going verse by verse, the context of why Simon is even here. It's the festival season. As, we, as we've been looking the past month over the last week of Jesus' life, he spent it every day teaching in the temple courts, and then in the evenings he went and they camped out on the Mount of Olives. But they weren't alone up there. They were surrounded by tens of thousands of other camps, because we know from Josephus, the Jewish non-Christian historian, describes that at Passover season, the population of Jerusalem would swell by two million people. Jews from all over the Roman Empire would come to Jerusalem, and it would swell by two million people. Well, guess what? That's where Simon is from. Simon of Cyrene. I circled it right down there on the bottom of the map. Cyrene. It means he was from North Africa, modern-day Libya. And it sounds like he just arrived. Could you imagine? 
You arrive, we find out from another passage, his kids are with him. He arrives, and he's just standing there, and all of a sudden, a Roman guard is standing at you saying, grab his cross, carry it. Welcome to town. <laughs> well, Simon was from 800 miles away in North Africa, modern-day Libya. Simon wasn't just a pilgrim visiting Jerusalem, but it appears he just arrived. He likely knew nothing about this Jesus and had no desire to be associated with this man who was condemned to die as a criminal. But when a Roman guard points at you and says, do this, they did it. Time out. Most likely Simon of Cyrene became a Jesus follower. We learned this as we've gone through. We've seen names like, remember Malchus, the servant whose ear was cut off by Peter and Jesus put it back on? I told you that when we see a name like that, that's good evidence that they were a part of the early church because we know their name. Same thing here with Simon, but it goes even deeper. We have good evidence that Simon's entire family came to be Jesus followers. Look at this. This comes from Mark. Mark actually has a little more detail. This is where we know that he has his family with him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander, and Rufus, Remember that name, Rufus? Because it comes back up. Paul talks about Rufus. In Romans chapter 16, he's writing to the, to the Romans. Sounds like Rufus is up in Rome now. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Listen, it wasn't the Roman guard who chose Simon. It was the Lord. Because the Lord wanted to reach Simon's entire family. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, look at this, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Simon of Cyrene, this guy who just arrived in town, hey everybody, what? Carries the cross. His wife becomes like a second mother to the Apostle Paul. Do you realize how nuts this story is? It's because God is amazing. More than anyone, Simon had a very personal, intimate view of the cross. He was close enough to hear every word Jesus whispered. He saw every sight, smelled every smell, and heard every abuse and mocking voice. I guarantee you that he was spat upon. Probably had some rotten vegetables thrown at him. Probably people in the crowd thought that Simon was the criminal because he was carrying the cross. Or a criminal who was going to die. Outside of the guards and Jesus, Simon was the only one to touch the very cross Jesus would die on. Simon had a ringside seat for the cross and experienced the depth of how much Jesus loved him. You know, Simon wasn't a murderer like Barabbas. But Simon had poison in his heart. We've talked about this. The wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6, 23. That means when we sin, we earn death. So sin, we lust after that girl... Lose our temper at our wife, more poison in our heart that causes death. Not physical death necessarily, but spiritual death. And when we die, if there's any poison in our heart, we die for eternity separated from God. But what Jesus did is that cup of his, representing his, his death on the cross, his blood paid for our sin. And he drank it as if he is the one who did it. He paid the price so that when we die, even though all of us in this room have lusted, gossiped, lost our temper, maybe even some in this room have committed murder. When we die, it's gone because Jesus drank it. And Simon was in town. He was in town for the festival. He and his family brought a sacrifice 
to atone for their sin. He needed it too. And Jesus drank Simon's poison. If Simon, listen to this. From that life-changing moment on when Simon carried that cross to Calvary, if Simon ever questioned if God loved him, all he had to do was remember the cross that he carried so that Jesus could die on it. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. So these women are following him. You know, that's traditional that there would be women who would mourn over those being crucified. But I guarantee there were women in this crowd of women following and mourning over Jesus who were women who were part of the crowd who gathered early in the morning, like we learned back in 21, chapter 21, early in the morning to hear Jesus teach. And they're brokenhearted. What is happening? Jesus. And they're mourning over Jesus dying. And Jesus turned to them and said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. What? He's about to die. He's just been torn to shreds. And he says, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves because Jesus knows what's coming. He predicted it. Remember? Chapter 21. Jesus, it's the last week of his life on earth, and he and his disciples sitting around the campfire on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples are going, look how beautiful that temple is. And Jesus says, guys, listen, not one stone's going to remain on another. Every single stone you've seen is going to be thrown down by an enemy army. And sure enough, we know from history that happened in 70 A.D., so as Jesus is carrying the cross, or he's actually walking in front of the cross because he's so weak. Jesus is so beaten that his very spine may have been exposed. He's so weak from hypervolemic shock that he can't carry the cross. He's about to die in torture, but instead of embracing the love mourning over him, he looks upon them with pity and grieves over what they and their children's generation would have to experience. Listen, if you ever wonder how God feels about Jerusalem and the Jewish people, look to the cross. Because he was grieving over what they were going to be going through. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. In that culture, that was considered to be cursed by God. Around this church, we have a special place in our heart for for families that can't conceive, for couples. Special place. We are four couples that can't conceive. And how hard that is. Last week, we had our butterfly memorial. A bunch of people came and we, we, we had a celebration of life for those kids who haven't been able to be conceived or kids that were lost. Man, it's hard. Well, back then it was worse. It wasn't just that you couldn't have kids. It was that you were cursed by God. And if you had a bunch of kids, well, you were blessed by God. That's how that culture looked at it. Well, Jesus turns it on its head and says, if you have kids, you're cursed because of what's coming to your kids. If you didn't have any kids, you're blessed because they're not going to have to go through it. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover up. I mean, Jesus... He prophesied stunning detail. We looked at it a few weeks ago when we were in 21 about what would happen in in Titus in 70 AD. So just 40 years later, less than 40 years, Titus came and sieged, sieged warfare against Jerusalem. And it got so bad. They were cut off from all food that the Jewish people inside the city walls turned on each other. And more people died at the hands of gangs roaming around looking for food than were killed by the Romans. In fact, Titus in history is said that when he finally got in through the city walls, there was so much death, so much uh, gruesomeness around that he said, we didn't do this. 
That's how bad it was. And Jesus knew it was coming. And so he, he's like, don't worry about me. Let's grieve over you about what you're going to go through. For if people do these things, if they're being this cruel when the tree is green, what will happen when it's dry? We've gone through the entire book of Luke this year. And Jesus is taught through parables the entire time. This is his last parable. And he's basically saying, hey, I'm alive right now. When a tree is alive, it's green. There's water and the nutrients going through the tree. So if they act this cruel when tree, the thing is green, well, I'm about to die. When I'm gone and a tree dries out, you know, uh, Kaylin and, and uh, our team, they've removed a bunch of trees that were dry around here over the past month. When they're dry, they dry out and they fall over. And he's basically saying, if they're this cruel when I'm here, what's going to stop them when I'm gone? And that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. It was even more cruel towards each other, towards the masses. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. Okay, we read it last week. Just like the prophet Isaiah prophesied, predicted 700 years earlier that that would happen. He'd be, he'd be killed, numbered among criminals. When they came to the place called the skull, circle the word skull there if you're taking notes in your Bible. The reason why is because that's the name of our church. Did you know this? It's true. We should be called Skull Chapel or Skull Mac. Calvary is Latin. Golgotha is Greek, Koine Greek. In English, it means place of a skull. So I'm thinking about changing our, our logo. <laughs> Derek's like, yeah. You guys like, I knew I shouldn't go to a church where there's a pastor who rides a hog, you know. It means skull. Place of a skull of death. You know, we don't know the, if you've been to Jerusalem, there's the different locations that are suggested for where Calvary, place of the skull is. We don't know exactly which place it was. One of them is probably right. But we do know this, that this was a very public location, likely right outside the city walls. In fact, probably right outside the main gate. And there's a purpose for it as a warning. Don't do what these guys did. That's where they would crucify people so that everybody would see it, everybody would know it. And they thought they were being clever. But you know who was actually being clever? God. When we were in Leviticus, Leviticus 23, watch that message on our website or on our app because it's such an, a critical chapter in Scripture. It lays out all the history of the Jewish people through the festivals. And there's three more festivals that lay out our future. We're waiting right now for the, next, the, the three festivals that haven't been fulfilled yet. The next one is the trumpets. I wonder what that refers to. But if we look back at this, the temple festivals, as you look through that, there were three times a year that all the male Jews needed to be in Jerusalem. Do you see why? God told the Jewish people that during the Passover festival, which is right here, this is the Passover day when Jesus was going through, the day that Jesus, you know, from the beginning, they should have known the Messiah would die on Passover. That's when he did. That it just happened that all the Jews would be in Jerusalem at that time so that the population swelled by 2 million people. Do you get it? God wanted people to walk by and see the Messiah, even if they didn't know who he was, hanging on the cross. So that three days later, at the Feast of First Fruits, the first fruit of resurrection rose from the dead. And then they all heard about it. Okay? God sovereignly orchestrated Jesus dying on Passover so that two million extra people would be in town to eyewitness, to be eyewitness to, eyewitnesses to Jesus' very public 
execution. If the Jewish people who came to worship God ever wanted to know how God felt about them, all they had to do was look at the cross. Why do you think they didn't go home? You know, they, some of them went home. They came back a few weeks later for the festival, the Feast of Pentecost. And all these people from all over the Roman world, many of whom spoke different languages, came in town. And that's when Pentecost happened. And they're like, how come these Galileans are all speaking in our language? We understand what they're saying. Hmm, it's almost like God planned it. Okay. Okay. When they came to the place called Calvary Mac, no. When they came to the place called the Skull, three words. They crucified him there. Luke uses only three words to describe crucifixion because everyone in the Roman Empire knew what it was. Luke is from Syria. He knew what crucifixion was. Us today, oh, we don't get it. We kind of have an idea about it. And so I'm going to go back to the case for Christ, Dr. Methurel. And then here's a medical understanding of what crucifixion is. Listen to this. He would have been laid down with his hand, and his hands would have been nailed in the outstretched position to the horizontal beam. The Romans used spikes. Listen to this. The Romans used spikes that were five to seven inches long and tapered to a sharp point. So I just happen to have some models of Roman nails that are five to seven. These are seven inches long, tapered to a point. And these are actually modeled by the nails that have been found from crucified bodies. that they would drive through the wrists and the feet. They were driven through the wrists, which was considered part of the hand in the language of the day. And so here's a, here's a model of what that looked like. So they would take this, put the body across there, That's what Jesus went through for you. Dr. Metherell goes on. And it's important to understand that the nail would go through the place where the median nerve runs. This is the largest nerve going out to the hand. And it would have been crushed by the nail that was being pounded in. Like taking a pair of pliers and squeezing and crushing that nerve. The pain was absolutely unbearable, Dr. Metherell concludes. In fact, it was literally beyond words to describe. In fact, they had to invent a new word, excruciating. Literally, excruciating is based on the phrase, out of the cross. At this point, Jesus was hoisted as the crossbar was attached to the vertical stake, and the nails were driven through Jesus' feet. His arms would have been immediately stretched, probably about six inches in length, and both shoulders would have become dislocated. Isn't that interesting that 900 years earlier, King David, Jesus' ancestor, on his mom's side, King David prophesied this about Jesus. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Once a person is hanging in the vertical position, Dr. Methrell concludes, crucifixion is essentially an agonizingly slow death by asphyxiation, by suffocation. If you ever question 
I don't care what you've done. If you ever question if God loves you, just look to the cross because that's what he did for you. His blood was poured out to take your consequence for everything you've done and died in your place so you don't have to. Verse 33, when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right. Oh, the irony here is so thick. One on his right and the other on his left. Remember earlier that day, remembering that the Jewish day began not at midnight, but at sunset the previous evening. So earlier that day where the purple line is on this chart, the disciples were still arguing about which one of them was the greatest. Remember that? I'm the greatest. You know, Peter was at the center of it. Well, now it's where the red line is, around nine in the morning when they're crucifying Jesus. Well, the book of Matthew actually records something that happened just before all of this, just an hour before or so, is that James and John... Two of the disciples conned their mom into going to Jesus and asking for a favor. Look at this. When the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, John who wrote Revelation, we're going to start in a month here, John who wrote the Gospel of John, <laughs> he had some stuff to learn first. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant me that these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup? We know what the cup is now. It was his sacrifice, his death for us, the scourging, the crucifixion. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Like, so they jump in. They con their mom. They're like, yeah, we can. Sure we can. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. They'll receive that life. They would also be tortured. James is the first of the 12 apostles to die for following Jesus. You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. Here's the key. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. How perfectly clueless the disciples and James and John's own mother had been as to what it meant to be at the right and left of Jesus as he secured his kingdom. Now, here's the key. Instead of a place of honor, God the Father sovereignly worked so that Jesus hung on a cross intentionally between two criminals. There's a reason for it. We're going to find that reason out here in a few moments. But this is all orchestrated. It's all by God's hand. And then we come to possibly the most powerful sentence ever uttered by a human being. More powerful than anything Shakespeare has written. More powerful than anything you see on TV. Right here. In the midst of all this injustice, the scourging, the spitting, the mocking as king, the crown of thorns, tearing him, shredding him to pieces, nailing him to a cross. In the midst of all that, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If you want to know if Jesus loves you, just look to the cross. Why? Because despite the injustice, hate, and anger, Jesus prayed even for his executioners asking God the Father to not hold this sin against them. If he loves and forgives those who carried out his murder, how much more can he love and forgive you? I don't care what you've done. I don't care. You know why? 
because he died for it. He paid for it. You don't have to die for what you've done. He did. He paid the sentence and he forgives you. Well, how could he forgive them? Because he knew they were absolutely blind. The enemy's most potent weapon in his arsenal. And when I say the enemy, the Jews were not Jesus' enemy. The Romans were not his enemies. Pilate was not his enemy. Satan himself, he was an angel named Lucifer who fell from heaven, led a rebellion, and a third of heaven fell with him, were thrown to the earth by God as punishment. And their goal is to wipe out the Messiah. Why do you think Satan was so desperate to get him on a cross? That's the real enemy. Well, they knew what they were doing, but they didn't understand the full weight of why they were doing it. To them, it was about protecting political power and societal peace. To the true enemy, Satan, they were all mere pawns to finally take revenge upon God. But they had no idea that their hour of darkness was the hour of their eternal defeat. <laughs> if you ever question if God loves you, just look to the cross. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots, like, like choosing straws, you know, picking straws. Again, that's a prophecy that was predicted by David 900 years earlier in Psalm 22. If you don't believe in God, okay, if you're just checking this out, read Psalm 22 and then read the crucifixion. Read Isaiah 53 and then read the crucifixion, realizing there is no doubt those were written hundreds of years earlier. Anyway, that's a side note. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Okay, so Jesus just prayed. Father, forgive them. Forgive them. Don't hold them accountable for this. God the Father is on the throne. And God the Son is interceding. He is representing them before the Father. That's what we learned Jesus' ultimate job is. He is our interceder. He, inter he represents us before the Father. And he represents the Father to us. He is, according to Hebrews, our great high priest. We learned this back in Leviticus and Exodus. Well, we learned that, remember how the three offices of the Old Testament, prophet, priest, and king, that became the foundation of how Jesus was mocked here at the crucifixion, where the temple guards, they put a bag over Jesus' head, and they beat him and said, prophesy, who's hitting you? They were mocking him as a prophet. Herod, who wanted to be king but couldn't be called a king according to the Roman Senate, mocked him as a king and put a crown of thorns on him and the, the long robe on him. They, he mocked his guards. They mocked him as a king. Well, here they're mocking Jesus as the priest, the high priest. Here he's interceding for them. Say, you can't even save yourself. Jesus is our great high priest. It was precisely because he did not save himself that he did save us. If you ever question if God loves you, just look to the cross. Verse 36, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And so these Roman soldiers, they have no idea who this guy is. All they know is they're, they're supposed to kill him and crucify him. So they're joining in with the crowd. The crowd's mocking him. They join right in with the crowd, blindly following the crowd. There was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. Now, this isn't just the charge. Look something like this. We know from another gospel that it was three, in three languages. This is the king of the Jews. This wasn't just the charge that they, they crucified Jesus by, that Pilate condemned him with. This was Pilate's revenge. 
against the Jewish leaders. Because we know, I, I think it's in John where the Jewish leaders, they see this sign and they come to Pilate and say, hey, don't write that this is the king of the Jews, but rather that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate says, nope, what I wrote, that's what sticks. Because it was on purpose. He was irritating them. Remember, Pilate's verdict on Jesus was not guilty, but their manipulation of the mob with anger and passion had forced him to violate his own conscience, and Pilate didn't appreciate it. He gave in to their demands, but still got the last word with the phrasing on this sign to infuriate them. Now, right here, remember the sign. On top of the cross above his head, with the crown on his head, this is the king of the Jews. Very important because God sovereignly has criminals on his right and left who can read that sign. That'll be important in a moment. Verse 39, one of the criminals, <clears throat> this is why it's important. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah Save yourself and us, just blindly going along with the crowd and adding, save us while you're at it. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. You know, we, we committed a crime that was worthy of a capital offense, that poison. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. So God designed it all to happen, including having the criminals on his right and left. Well, here's the reasons why. Three reasons. First reason is this. The first reason God orchestrated Jesus dying between two criminals, it was to highlight Jesus' innocence by contrast. And so this criminal is here, and he sees Jesus, and he sees the other criminal, and he knows there's a difference. He knows the wickedness of his own heart. He knows what he's done. He's like, you know what? We deserve this. He doesn't. And while the other criminal deserved their fate, Jesus did not, yet both were personal eyewitnesses to the cross. Can I just say that this criminal was probably like most people that I've met who've spent time in prison or jail or living their life just getting in trouble, have a record. Most people like that don't feel like God can love them or that God doesn't. Most people like that feel, oh, no, no, God may love other people. They'll even come to church. They'll bring their kids to church because they want their kids to be saved, even though there's no way God could save them. There's no way God loves them. I guarantee that this man sitting on that cross probably doubted God loved him. But when he looked at Jesus on the cross, he saw that God not only loved him, but sent his son to die for his sins. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Do you know what we just read? That should shock us for a couple reasons. First is this. First is this. The thief on the cross just prayed the first quote, Sinner's prayer. That's a modern term, sinner's prayer. But a sinner's prayer is when you realize you've sinned and earned death and you ask God to save you. You ask Jesus to be your Lord. In the 20th century, they called it the sinner's prayer. That's what he did. He's like, man, we deserve this. We deserve this, but he doesn't. Hey, Jesus, remember me when you become king. It's simple. Just crying out to Jesus. In the 20th century, they called it the sinner's prayer. The Bible says, cry out to Jesus. That's it. It's so simple. A sinner's prayer is when someone 
prays to accept Jesus as their savior by admitting they've sinned and declaring to God that they've rely, they're relying on Jesus Christ as your Lord. But did you notice what else he said? Jesus is hanging on the cross. He is about to die sooner than the others, probably because he's been ripped to shreds so much. And even then, this guy who probably doesn't know anything about Jesus, about what he's taught, looks at Jesus and says, hey, I know you're dying, but you're going to be a king. How did he know that? Well, for one thing, it was written right above his head. Pilate thought it was revenge. God said, no, it's identification. Here's a dying criminal being executed next to a man who has a sign above his head reading, this is the king of the Jews. And by the wonder of God, he believes it. <laughs> Somehow he had faith that though Jesus was dying, he trusted Jesus was coming into his kingdom. I love what Pastor Chuck says about this verse. He said this, Oh, how easy salvation is. You don't have to raise your hand and come down front. Uh-uh. You can just cry out to Jesus where you sit right now. Oh, how easy salvation is. How simple God has made it. If there was ever a lesson that taught us salvation is not through works, it's right here. It's not what you do. It's what he did. He couldn't do much works at this point. Not much he could do for God now. It's not what you do for him. It's what he did for you. It's not going to church that saves you. It's not going on a mission trip. It's not going door to door. It's none of that stuff. I said, it's not going door to door. I look back, Roger's cracking up because he, he was a Jehovah's Witness. We had to do that. But he found Jesus, and he found out that Jesus died for him. So he, it's not what he does. It's not what you do. It's what he did. We'll finish with verse 43. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today, oh, this is beautiful. Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. The second reason God orchestrated Jesus dying between two criminals was to save a lost man who had wasted his life. Is that you? I know I wasted a lot of my life, okay? Jesus was about to die, and then this criminal would die. Have you ever noticed this? He became the first Jesus follower to wake up in the presence of Jesus. Did you know that? We know that Jesus dies first. And then the two others on the cross, the two criminals, they were still alive and breathing, so they broke their legs so they couldn't pull themselves up to breathe again. So when they broke his legs and he finally suffocated to death, he woke up in the presence of Jesus, the first person in recorded history. It was at that moment when he realized all that poison he, broke, he earned in his heart his whole life, Jesus paid for it. So that when he died physically, there was no poison left in his heart from sin and was welcomed into eternity with Jesus. If you ever questioned if God loves you, just look to the cross. The third reason God orchestrated Jesus dying on the cross between two criminals was so that as he suffered, Jesus could in real time experience the joy in what he was accomplishing. Did you know Jesus was not happy on the cross? He 
because happiness depends upon circumstances. But we know with zero doubt that Jesus had joy on the cross. How do we know? Because the Bible tells me so. Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy, what? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Do you realize you are the reason Jesus went through all this? I'm going to have the band come up. But don't miss this. You are the reason he endured the cross. You were the joy of the cross. We talk about that a lot around here. What does God enjoy? It's not, did we enjoy the service? No, it's, did God enjoy this service? Do people in the community like what we're doing in this church? No, does God like what we're doing in this church? Well, if you want to know what God enjoys, it's when someone who is lost is found. And I love this picture. It's by Thomas Blackshear. It's called Forgiven. That's it. We're the reason he went to the cross because he was taking care of what we've done. But we're the reason he stayed on the cross and endured it to death. This is why. Paying the deadly consequence for our sin is why Jesus willingly went to the cross. But the joy of saving us is how he was able to endure it. And by God's sovereignty, when Jesus was on the cross, his father arranged it so that there was a criminal on the right and left. And one of them spat at Jesus and mocked him and didn't ever turn around from that. But the other one, who from another gospel, also mocked Jesus, came around. And Jesus on the cross was to experience his greatest joy, which was seeing a lost person found. And if you haven't been found, don't need an altar call. Don't need to come up front. All you need to do is during this last song, as we stand and we sing about the joy of the cross, is say, Jesus, I'm yours. Remember me. <laughs> when you come into your kingdom. Remember me because you're my king. Let's stand up and let's cry out the joy of the cross in this song.